the secondary over the primary. You see, all throughout Christ's ministry, he performed amazing miracles, but all the miracles were secondary. We want the supernatural over the natural. We want the signs and the wonders over the word. We need to get back to seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he will add these things unto us. Making that, making the kingdom the sole focus of our gatherings, and he will add the extras. So I want to ask you this question today before we get too far into this. What is it that we long for today? What is our aim What satisfies our hunger? What satisfies our thirst? What hydrates a dry spirit? What is it that will accomplish today? What is it that will succeed today? What will make this gathering of believers today a success? Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the hearer, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. You see, it's not just rain that's being spoken of here, not just water, it's life. It's speaking of life exactly as verse 10 is, verse 11 is. It's going to do what it does. Cause and effect. It's a promise of life. Without the word, there is no life. Without the word, the seeds dry up and blow away. Without the word, all go hungry. Much emphasis has been placed recently on outpourings of the Holy Spirit, revivals, spiritual works, and awakenings. Are they real? Absolutely. Absolutely, they happen. Are they all real? No. They are not all real. Now, this isn't the uh, popular opinion right now. Uh, This is put a target on your back uh, type material. But it's the truth. Just because someone says God is moving does not mean that God is moving. God moves in certain ways. God moves in ways that matches the scripture. There's an old saying that says, where there's smoke, there's fire. That's not always true. Sometimes where there's smoke, it's actually just foggy. You know the smoky mountains? That's not really smoke. (laughs) But if they're real... If there's smoke and there's fire, they last. They will last. We must consider that the word of God will lift the fog. The word of God will lift the fog. And in that, you critics of people who want to divide things with the word of God, people who call that legalism, That's not legalism. To divide something with Scripture is Christian living. It's Christian living. 
I don't mind when someone questions my beliefs or someone questions my preaching as long as they're doing it with the word of God. They are commanded to do so. Commanded to do so. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. That's like a swear word nowadays. Doctrine. If something is a true filling of the Spirit, it will produce fruit. It will produce eternal fruit. The scary thing is, and, and I want you to hear me out on all of this, okay? Don't jump to a conclusion, then go to Facebook and attack what I'm saying, and not put my name, please put my name on it if you're going to do that, so I don't have to wonder if you're talking about me. What scares me, this famine that we live in, have been living in, has heightened our sense for Pentecost, right? Now, that don't sound bad, but here's where you have to hear me out. We want the rain to fall. We want the winds to blow. We want the tongues of fire to proceed. But what happens when the highs sink and the music stops? What happens when you're back to work and family and chores and the crowds leave and the hallways are empty? What's there when it's back to the everyday grind of the Christian life? The word remains. The word remains. 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Christian, the day you were saved was your Pentecost. NASA doesn't cheer when the rocket ship is fueled. It's necessary, but it's not the end in itself. It's not the mission. It's not the commission. It's the preparation for the mission. The world cheers when the rocket launches. That's what everybody wants to see. You don't need another Pentecost. Set the fuel on fire and burn. Set the fuel on fire and move. You see, Jesus had announced the follow-up to Pentecost even before the day of Pentecost. I asked myself this question this week, and I'd like you to do the same. What if we got as excited about his words and his current work as we do anticipation of something that he never promised would happen again. A second Pentecost. What Jesus did say would happen after Pentecost was this. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It will last. Pentecost was the channel that launched. Are you ready for this? The channel that launched this very miraculous hand of God, Christ, heartbeat, movement called the local church. I know, right? So anticlimactic, right? Just... That's not what you expected. You wanted something bigger. You wanted something with more emotion and more pizzazz and more flash, but it's all the local church. What happened then 
What happened at Pentecost was for the purpose of right now. Right now, what we are doing now, the gathering and the growing or expanding of his church both locally and globally. It's not necessarily flashy, nor does it always feel supernatural, but the miracle of Pentecost is the church. Christ's church. So anything that takes away from the local church or would draw people away from the local church is anti-Pentecost. The church is God's plan. The church is Christ's work, and the word is the heartbeat of his people. Therefore, preaching is always primary in Christ's church. It waters, and it grows, and it feeds, and it matures. So the sequel to Pentecost is still playing today. We are a part of it, and it's not Pentecost again. It's not Pentecost part two. It's the local church, Christ's church. So the supernatural Pentecost brought about the seemingly natural church. Think of what follows Acts. Think of what follows Acts 2. Letters. Right? Letters to who? Preachers and churches. Most of them fighting to keep their head above the water. Fighting for some relief. Fighting for some meat. Immediately after Pentecost... Peter steps out onto the steps and steps upon toes. Filled with the Spirit, Peter preached a doctrinally rich sermon. It's what real preaching does. The Bible says he lifted up his voice and addressed them. That's preaching. And then he quotes scripture. That's also preaching. Preaching always is built around the scripture. And then Peter does something that people don't like about preaching, but it is preaching. He gets to the you of it. He gets to the you. And we read about this in Acts 2, uh, 22. We're going to read kind of throughout this and so just kind of hang on and And right along here, 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified Yikes. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And then I think he probably paused for dramatic effect because that's what preaching does. God raised him up. Oh, the controversial words right there. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Peter's saying, let me introduce you to the gospel. Skip down to verse 32. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are All witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. 
For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, here we go again, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter said to them, this is real preaching, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You want Pentecost, repent and be baptized and you will receive the Holy Spirit. That's how it's going to work from now on. You see, the purpose of the Spirit of God is to lead us to Christ. In Acts 2, the Spirit of God led the people then to gather in an orderly manner. Not out of order, not chaos, orderly manner. To engage in worship and discipleship and missions Ta-da! The local church. Here you are. Here you are. You see, the emphasis on this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit was placed on the gathering and the sending out of the local church. In the rest of the story, go home and read it for yourself. The rest of the story is focused on the organizing of the people of God who then come together from different backgrounds, in different races, in different ages, in different occupations, all under the head that is Christ Jesus. So so the Holy Spirit is present in his church. Right here in this place. More than that, the Holy Spirit of God is omnipresent and doesn't need to be chased down to experience it. The presence resides in all who have called upon the name of the Lord. Pentecost of the heart in the engaging in the church. Welcome to revival, church. So what is our aim? Is it Acts 2 or is it Titus 2? See why we long for Acts 2? (laughs) Seems like a lot less work. A lot less commanded from us. You mean I have to sit down with the young wives and teach them how to be better wives to their husband? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. You mean I have to take these young men, look at them over there paying attention, proud of you guys. I have to take these young men and I have to build them up into God. Yes, you do. Well, I'm going to need a Pentecost for that. Well, congratulations. You're born again, you've had one. You've had one. Acts 2 or Titus 2. We need genuine discipleship. We need a reality of godly living. We need grace. We need everyday grace. You see, Pentecost didn't change the world. It's what happened because of Pentecost that changed the world. Acts 8, 4 through 5. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. 
Why are we desiring a filling of what we are already filled with? Set fire to the fuel. That's what needs to happen. You see, God does Acts 2. We do Titus 2. The infallible, incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed that is the Word of God, that is our Bible, from which the church itself is led. It's the blueprint. Then shepherded by fallible men, by elders, by pastors, by teachers and overseers who are called to lead and to teach this bride of Christ. He's telling the teachers how to preach and to teach the word. And he's telling the members how to receive the word. Again, preaching isn't everything, but it affects everything. You see, there may be believing without seeing, but there is no believing without hearing. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then I want to consider 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. This is the last letter that Paul would pen to Timothy, the young preacher, that Paul had left in Ephesus. He said, I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Timothy, preach the word. It may seem foolish, but preach nevertheless. Command my people to hear the word. Command people to believe it and respond to it. Lay it out for them to love the word. Speak it so clear that everyone can understand it. Not just get it, but preach it in a way that it squeezes against the soul of every hearer so it creates conviction and a desire to be changed by the word. Make them feel the weight of the curse of sin. Make them feel the weight of their pride and their rebellion. Hold the people to the truth. Strap their feet to the fire. Preach the word. Herald that which is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the soul, the vision of the soul and spirit of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Get to the you of it, Timothy. Preach the word. Preach the word regardless of the consequences. People will hate you. People will abandon you. People will leave your church. They'll call you legalistic and all sorts of crazy things, but stay the course, Timothy. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, preach the word. Church, there's nothing like preaching. If God is commanding, the pre- that was for me, by the way, If God is commanding the preaching of the word, something else is automatically commanded in that. Preaching takes place in the presence of people. If I have to preach it, you have to listen to it. I don't know who's got the better end of the deal there. You must listen to the word preached. I must listen to the word preached. Hear the word, surrounded by others. Because the local church, right? Christ is more glorified through us doing things God's way than by us forsaking God's way while presuming to love the word. While presuming to love the Bible. Well, we're having this movement 
We're having this feeling, this revival, and there's no preaching, but we love the Bible. Listen, it's only the truth that sets free. 2 Timothy 4.17, Paul's finishing this letter up. He says, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. This knowledge, this power, this enlightening of the eyes of our hearts comes only by the knowledge of the Word, God's Word. To ask God to do something without the Word being preached or taught or read is severing the body from the head. There's no life once the head is separated from the body. There might be movement. Oh, it looks like life. There may seem to be a response, many thinking that the kicking and the flailing of the body are signs of life when in fact it's the first sign of death. Once you've decapitated Christ, it makes way for the kicking and flailing that comes with death. Ask yourself this question, where's the word? And when you find it, you'll know that's where there's life. That's where there's life So if you want to check the pulse of a movement, you want to check the pulse of a church, you want to check the pulse of a life, then the Bible tells us, commands us to test the spirits. Listen closely to the thumps that come from the pulpit. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The local church, immersed in the power of God's word, is revival. That's it. That's revival. The local church, Christ's church, which the gates of hell will not prevail against, immersed in his word, in preaching, in hearing, in action. That's where there's life. That's where there's revival. 